grateful that God has saved you, that God has given you life, you know, there's breath in your nostrils, you have a good family, all of a sudden you get to this church and there is this unhealthy appetite for wealth and you just want to become, you're, you're overwhelmed and, you know, pushed with the idea of just living for the wealth that the world offers. And, and the Bible is very clear, you know, that your life, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. And so what is the balance? A good church will teach you that money is a neutral element. It's neutral. It's a transactionary tool, right, for exchanging goods and services. So let it be that and seek, use every part of your life, including the wealth you have for God's glory. And so any church that sees that idea of um, money being a tool for God's glory, that's a good church. A church that does not say, you know, if you don't tight, things will be tight for you, you know, trying to cajole you to give money. When the Bible clearly says that God loves a cheerful giver. So you don't want to be in that kind of church where they have the wrong teaching on money. Jesus taught about money more than heaven and hell combined. You'll be shocked, but check the Gospels. Jesus taught about money more than heaven and hell combined. So money is a crucial aspect of your faith. In fact, my pastor calls it the spiritual stethoscope of your heart. What, where does your money go? It tells us where, what you really believe. So being a church that has a good understanding of money and puts it in its place, money should not rule over you. The third thing is, are they missions minded? Maybe, meaning that they are not just all about the numbers every Sunday, but they are looking at how to train people in that church to be a blessing to those who are outside. You know, make, Many people will never hear the gospel because they will not walk into a church. How many people do you know that are unbelievers that say, well, I feel like spending my Sunday in church today? Very rarely. And so a church should be training you to be able to reach the lost outside. So that church should have a mindset of we want to win the lost. We want to win people who are, you know, they're, they're under the blindness that the Bible talks about, that the people in the world are blinded by the prince of the power of the air right now, right? Um, and so that veil needs to be removed. So God wants to train us in a good local assembly to be missions-minded. You want to always be thinking about how can I see someone else saved? So a good sign of a good church is that they are not always talking about this new project, that new project, because there are many churches that are all about projects, projects, increasing the size of their current branch you know, or just keeping it as a status quo, not really training people to others outside as possible recipients of the gospel. So mission-mindedness. And then the final one, which is, I put it last because if you don't find this one, it's not a, it's not, it's not a deal breaker, but it is ideal that you have this. And that is what I call a charismatic ministry. So th does the church believe in the gifts of the spirit? Does the church believe in the spirit of God working today? Now, I'm not talking about the excesses. There are people who all they do, they don't have sermon notes. They don't have any just to come and just be manifesting and that, doing all these weird things in church. No, there must be sound doctrine. But any ch church that emphasizes sound doctrine over the move of the spirit for today is, is lacking something. And so you want to check, does this church believe in the gifts of the Spirit? Do they believe that the Spirit is still at work today? Do, you be, do they believe that God can still heal through us? Do they believe that we, we can speak in tongues, we can see interpretations, we can see miracles today? Because any church that has put turned their back on the Holy Spirit has become a religion, an empty religion, because Christianity is not just a religion. It's a walk. It's a faith walk. It's a, it's a, it's a daily experience with the living God of the Bible. You get what I'm saying. So if you if you want to choose yes. a church, those are four things you must not lose. So if you go to a church and maybe they are making some mistakes here and there are some things here, it's fine as long as those four things are there. So again, the gospel must be preached accurately. It must sound like what the Bible teaches, what the epistles teach about who God is and what he has done in Christ. So Christ must be central to what he teaches. Secondly, there must be 
a very firm understanding of money that is balanced. No extremes there. Just money is a tool. Money is not the be all, have all of your life. It's a tool that God can use to glorify his name in your life. Number three, mission mindedness, right? Always thinking about how to reach the lost. And number four, they should trust in the move of the spirit for the day. If you have those things, you are in a good church and you should bless God that you have that because a lot of people are lacking that in their lives. All right. So I think that was a great teaching opportunity. So Pearl, put that into your mind um, as you make a firm decision on your local church to join. Right. I know a few yeah. that I could tell you that have been tested and trusted, but I want you to also make sure that you're, you're seeking God in this process. Let God lead you. Um, to a very good church. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, can you take the summary of three and four again? Sorry. Three and four. Mission mindedness, meaning they are focused on reaching the lost. Salvation is, is very important to them. Um, because Jesus said, Go ye therefore into the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing men, and you know, teaching them all that I've taught you. So discipleship and evangelism should be important to that church. And then the last point is. They should believe in the gifts of the spirit for today. So they must be charismatic. Um, I'm not, and I said it doesn't mean excessive, it just means they believe that the spirit is, is at work and they are open to his move in their services. Make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, awesome. So um, that was a good preamble. I think we can um, maybe I'll hear from one more person and then we'll jump into our teaching today. It's going to be an amazing time. So who would like to share? What they learned in church today. You went to church today. What did you learn? I think I mentioned Judith. I don't know if you had the chance to go to church today, Judith. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, so I went to church today, but like my church was in more of a um social event thingy. So it okay. wasn't but then I got back home and I was because I was following the UK anniversary. Oh so nice. Like joined that and it was really nice. So yeah. Awesome. And, and I want to even speak on that. For those of you who don't know that my church, I mean, yeah, most of you that are in BMG know that um, my church is Celebration Church and God has done a mighty thing with um, in this in, in UK. Um, just within the past two years, they've planted three active locations, like church locations, and there's one more to come very soon. I think it's even four. If I'm, yeah, almost because the other people, the other group meets in like a in, a in a house, and God is just being good. Like you see, and and what I was thinking was, as I was watching it, you know, partially, I was like, God is so kind that these people did not know they needed this, but God preempted their need, and now see how they are growing. See people just finally getting to hear the gospel of Jesus. Some of them for the very first time, you know. I saw a lady. You know, white lady was in the meeting and she, she was in tears. She came out, you know, surrendered her life to Christ, received the life of Christ and just the joy, you know, the excitement that, wow, we came from Africa, right? And we came to this place where, you know, the gospel was first or was, let me not say first, but for a, a huge part of our Christian history comes from the West, right? For example... Yeah. The fact that you have the English Bible, you have some people to thank. You have from from the slavery part with William Wilberforce to the um, writing of like, uh, you know, putting these manuscripts from the, the Greek translation to to English. We have people like um, what's this? He has a name that starts with W as well. Um, um, maybe Ife can help me here. A number of people. John Hall was one of the people in the west in in the uk um this guy very 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 popular guy with is it Whitfield? no um william tyndale thank you very much you see if i a scholar here william tyndale from the uk you know oxford university was very instrumental to us having the bible in english language in many ways so you, you can see how like it's flipping right the west brought some of these things to us but now we are bringing it back to them because they've forgotten God hugely in the UK. It's dark, spiritually dark. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a beautiful thing to see what God is doing around the world. And 
God is about to go start something really big again here in the U.S. We already have a church, and we're trying to expand. So, like, man, God is good. God is good. We're going to see God move mightily. All right. So, thank you for sharing that, Judith. Um, I'm trusting God that we're going to finish today's session in time because there's very little to discuss. There's good content, but very little time. And I just really want to spend today um, charging us by the power of God and by his spirit to live lives full of honor. That's the, the whole point of our meeting today. So I'm going to pray for us right now and then give a little recap and just jump into the yeah. Are we ready? Yes. All right. So let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your grace in Christ Jesus, the grace that brings salvation to all men that we have received gladly with the joy in our hearts. We thank you. And we are ready to be instructed in righteousness today. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Thanks. All right. So because I'm in a different environment right now, I can't share my screen. So I really would implore you, if you have your Bible, your physical Bible close to you, grab it. All right. If anyone here has the ability to share screens, um, and show some of the scriptures, please do. But I really need some help. Um, I only have one device right here and my notes to my side. So if you can follow me script in scriptures, that would be awesome. So let's go to Second Timothy. You've heard the scripture so many times, but I want to show you something that you might not have seen. So go to Second Timothy real quick. Second Timothy chapter 2. And let's look at verse. Let's look at chapter three. Hold on. Chapter three, verse 16. All right. So, Second Timothy chapter three from verse 16. Is there anything in the chat I'm missing? Okay, no. All right. Glory to God. I just saw something in the chat. So, pray said, I attended a church service where the pastor said, if you have wisdom or power and you don't have prosperity, you are useless. And I thought about, <laughs> he said, I thought about Jesus. That's, a, that's actually what you should think about. And the pastor there did not do it, taking your mind away from Jesus because Jesus did not have, in fact, Jesus said himself, he said, the son of man has nowhere to rest his head. Meaning, you know, in a simple way, I live trusting in God's provision. That's what the Christian should have. Not, not every Christian will have all the money in the world, but with the little you have, are you, are you satisfied? Are you content? Very, very important stuff. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. You know, we've read this. Many of us have memorized it. But how many of you read the preceding verses? So if you go to verse 14, it says, but as for you, that's in contrast to evil people who are deceiving the, the, the world, you know, with their false teachings. It says, as for you, pay attention to this, verse 14, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. So there's there are two levels here. There is the instruction part. You learn. For example, as we're in this meeting, some of you are hearing things and you're learning things. But then there is a second level, firmly believe. So you didn't just listen and hear stuff, but you went ahead to internalize and form a strong conviction about that thing. He says, continue what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. So three, three levels here. The message itself, all right, what you've learned, the conviction and the teacher. <laughs> so these are three things to pay attention to. I'm laughing because I just, you know, got just just got something right now, you know, and I, I, I can just see how beautiful God is in his um in his wisdom, how he has designed that we learn the word of God. Because a lot of people have this idea of learning God's word in a vacuum. Like, oh, just lock me up and give me a Bible and I'll figure everything out. And you know, that's one of the, it's insane. Let me just put it that way. Because how many of you 
in school decided, you know what, I'm going to learn chemistry. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go and discover things for myself. So I'm going to discover the elements, right? I'm going to dis discover um, how a centrifuge works without having a textbook. How many of you did that? How many of you ever went to a classroom and said, I'm going to discover what physics is about? Nobody. We all rely on resources. We rely on the information passed on by textbooks and instruction manuals to, do, to know what we know today. And so when it comes to the Christian faith, that idea of isolating yourself and, oh, God will teach me, God will instruct me, is, is very, very dangerous. Because not only is it dangerous, it is a very slow process. Because let's say you finally discover electricity <laughs> for the first time and realize how it works, and start writing your thesis, and you've done like five years in that process, and then you realize, oh, Benjamin Franklin already did this. Like, you see the wasted time and effort. And so when God gives us teachers, it's a blessing. Because these people have spent time studying. They've looked at these things. They've done the Greek, Hebrew analysis. They've looked at it and they've studied. And they've lived their lives knowing those things, fully believing those things. And so when we hear it from them, it has an effect in us. It teaches us, it instructs us. And then it says, knowing from whom you learned it. So there is, there is an intrinsic idea of honor for whoever teaches the word or for the word of God in you. Then look at verse 15, 2 Timothy 3.15. It says, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the secret writings talking about the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So he was talking to Timothy and he says, when you were a child, you learned these things. It's from, you didn't just learn it right now. It took a process. From childhood, you had known the scriptures. And then he tells us the purpose of the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So you, you are made wise about God's saving plan in Jesus Christ when you study the scriptures. And then he explains it further. That's where we get verse 16. That all scripture, all the sacred writings were inspired by God. And they had the purpose of what? Number one, to teach us, to instruct us. So we're supposed to be instructed when we read the word of God. So have this as your mindset. I'm taking a segue here to, to give someone a very instructive word. When you study the Bible, have it as a point of duty to be instructed, to be taught. So it's, let me tell you one of the things you can do to you know, to mismanage your time in the word of God. When you're just so focused on reading chapters and saying, oh, I want to just focus on reading my Bible today. If you don't live there instructed, you've mismanaged your time. So if you're reading the Psalms, what did you learn from David? What did this writing tell you about what your day should look like? You see what I mean? What lesson did I learn? Because the point of school or any education is to be instructed, to be taught. And guess what? One of the ways to test your knowledge is by giving you examinations. And what do those examinations aim to do? To test your knowledge. And so you may not be having tests, except that in BMG, we tend to do that sometimes, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. We just finished the book of Galatians and um, I gave you guys a quiz and somebody won. Oh, wait, please, is Pris here? Uh, okay, okay. I just wanted to be sure that I sent her a gift to her. I think I have. But you see, in the real, in the real world, right, the examination is your life. And you may not have proctors or invigilators or all those people that would check. But guess what you need? Clear understanding of the material. So when you take the exam of life, you know what to do. So if God tells you in the word of God, you're supposed to honor all men. That is instructive. The next thing you do is 
how does this teach me what I should do and how I should live every day? It, it, the word of God is not effective until it is used. It is not effective until it is practiced. In fact, the Bible calls it a double-edged sword. It's able to, and you know, a sword is useless until you wield it for war. It's just there. It's just fine and shiny and beautiful. But it's an, it's active, the Bible says. Um, Hebrews 4.12. It's active. Praise God. And so he says it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. What is reproof? So some people might read this as reproof. But in the original text, um, in, in the um, Greek Bible, the word for reproof is... Let me pull it up here so I, I can explain it to you. It doesn't mean reproof in the sense of making corrections because there's correction in that text. But reproof is from the Greek word elekos, all right? E-L-E-G-C-H-O-S. You don't have to write it down. I just want to make a point. And elekos actually means evidence. So it's not like reproof because when I say reproof, you're thinking correcting an error, right? But the actual word is proof, it's evidence. So a proof that by which a thing is proved or tested. And so the, the word of God is supposed to be for teaching and therefore evidence. So you learn something, right? You, you act it out and you see the result and you, you come back and you say, yeah, this is, this is proof of what I've experienced. This is proof. You know, that's, that's why there's a text in, um, I think it's Proverbs, that says wisdom is justified by her children. So the whole book of Proverbs has all these wise sayings, you know, look at the, the, the ants, go to the ants, you slow God, consider our ways and be wise. You know, there's, they don't have any ruler, no leader. But in, su in summer, they gather food so that in winter, they will have food to eat. That's wisdom, right? And so if you decide based on that, so, okay, be like the ants, observe them. When there is plenty, you save. When there is not so much, you find out that you still have something. Like you didn't spend all your salary. You said, okay, I'm going to be consistent with my saving habits. Even if I'm making just 30K Naira every month i can still save something and so maybe because life will life right life knows how to life <laughs> and something happens and you lose your job because you've looked at the ants when there is plenty they've saved guess what happens the word of god becomes proof it becomes evidence because you're like oh the word of god said this will, this is what i should do this is what will come as a result and i have experienced it that's what the scriptures are for. They teach, they reprove, which means to give evidence. And it says for correction. And this one is obvious, right? So I'm going a particular direction. I read the word of God. I see examples in scripture and I say, oh, ah, that's a warning. That's an instruction. And I turn. I reroute. That is what the word of God is for. And then it says for instruction in righteousness. So at the end of the day, everything you learn in the scriptures should bring about growth in righteous living. Like there should be something about your life that because you spend time in the word of God, you are kind, you are gentle, you are full of patience, you have joy. Like the fruit of righteousness should show in your life because you stayed in the scriptures. It's useful for that purpose. It's, that is what it's tailored to achieve. And so in this theme of honor, we've learned so many things, right? We've talked about the, the, the fact that we're called to honor the word of God in the first teaching, final say, the word of God is supreme authority. We just saw that here. It is the authority inspired by God to tell us how we ought to live. And then we went further and looked at categories what, who does God tell us to honor? And we concluded from scripture that he calls us to honor all men. Those in authority, those under us, those at the same level with us. Because the instruction is what? Honor all men. Romans chapter 12. We're supposed to honor everyone. 
But then we looked at the categories that when we say honor, honor is not just, oh, I honor you. You know, I give the example of people who, when they say, begin to bless the name of the Lord. What do you do when you find them saying, I bless you, Lord, I bless you, Lord? I'm like, you missed the point. To bless doesn't mean to say the word bless. To praise does not mean to say the word praise. Likewise, to honor does not mean to say I honor you. <laughs> it is in the actions. It is in the attitudes. All right. And we looked at that, that when it comes to honor, yes, we're meant to honor all men, but honor for certain people is not the same for others. So there's certain ways we're supposed to express honor to different categories of people in our lives. So we looked at three important um, realms of honor that God has put above us. So we honor all people, but we looked at the category of, of three specific groups that God has put over us that are, are, are what's the word, the English word now, How that we're supposed to honor, right? And those who can remind me, because I've been talking for a long time, who can tell me those three key figures of authority that God has placed in our lives that we ought to honor? All right, good. All right, good. Can I speak? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, our parents. Yep. The yep. government and our spiritual leaders. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, praise. So the home, that's family. There's leadership there. There's authority there. And so God has called us to honor them. And I said honor is not a is not something to debate about. It does not equal respect in every situation. But some of you are like, I can't honor them because I can't respect them. Well, the Bible does not say respect all men. It says honor all men. It means from the word simio in the Greek, you're supposed to value them as high, value them as worthy of honor. That's really the idea. It's like to, to give them a value and treat them as people that have that value. And that's why you can do it for anyone because they don't necessarily have to deserve it, but you are called to give them either way, right? And so your parents may be the worst people and you know they just they just don't understand you. And I said, well, the Bible says you should honor them. The Bible says you should honor them. So regardless of how they have treated you, because of the position they occupy in your life, by sovereign decree of God, you must honor them. I told you how that honor has to be done with wisdom in the teaching terms and conditions. That if you say um, you're supposed to honor them, well, you, you honor them in the Lord. So pray your parents in the Lord. So if they tell you to do something that will harm your faith or turn you away from Christ, that's the escape from that clause of honor. So that's why it's called terms and conditions. You know, when you want to download that app, you are so excited about the app, you forget to read the terms and the conditions. And how many of you know about this particular app that came at the time and you, you download the app and the app was supposed to make you older to see how you look like when you're old how many of you ever like there was a craze at the time for that particular app so you put your picture and then it will show you what you look like in your in your late years who remembers the app or who had an encounter with it it was really popular at the time nobody okay remember it right i've, I've forgotten the name but it was this app you put someone's face and just showed you how old you are how you would look when you're older sorry and so a lot of people were downloading it because it was funny and so they posted everywhere like oh see this and they were using it to mock people and stuff and then someone came out and said ah, i don't know if it was on twitter or somewhere but i saw it somewhere and the person was like this like in the terms and conditions it actually says very clearly that you give them license by downloading this app you give them license to use your facial features and your your, your face in the, the listed number of things they can use it in. And so people were like, you've just granted them by saying I accept and not reading the terms and conditions. You've sold your face to be used for anything, you know, anything anywhere. And that's, that's scary. So a lot of people started deleting, but if you have used the app, your face has gone. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so 
I maybe this is an instruction to you. Make sure you read terms and conditions when you are getting into a job. Don't be like, ah, God has answered my prayer. Thank you, Lord. I have this job. Read the fine print. What are they saying? What are they offering? Because you get into the job and by the end of the day, you, you didn't realize you are going to be <laughs> doing a certain thing for many years before you actually get paid. But you just heard, oh, this is the salary. You know, and so read, pay attention, be instructed. And so the same thing applies when it comes to the subject of honor. You know, there is something called um, stupid honor where you are not following the system God has designed for you to honor people. And because of that, you are hurting yourself. And this is one thing where God is meant to be more than anyone to you. And so there are limits to how much you honor a person when they are calling you to do things that are clearly frowned on in the word of God. Same thing applies to another group of people we are supposed to honor and give um, res you know, respect, due respect to. That would be um, the leaders, government, people in government. The Bible is very clear. We should honor those in government, those who are in authority, right? We're even supposed to pray for them. But when it comes to honoring authority, guess what? The restrictions are still there. The terms and conditions are still there. We don't just honor blindly. If they tell us, today you are going to start, all men are going to start <laughs> just being extreme here. Yeah? All men are going to start wearing skirts and using makeup and presenting as females. That's the rule of the land. Well, you, you know the word of God does not like messing with God's ideal gender system. And so in that situation, you cannot align. And so this, this spreads out to many other instructions that you may have in your government where they are telling you to do something that does not align with the will of God, right? And we see that example in the, in the scriptures, right? Um, the three Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, I think chapter three, all of a sudden they're in this particular, you know, land that they've been taken away from um, the Israel, and they've been brought into Babylon, and now they're ha they having to face a new culture, a new life. And, um, you know, we, we see how Daniel excelled. You know, he worked with these other three Hebrew boys and said, we're not going to bow. We're going to not eat the king's food. We're going to just trust us. We'll ju just give us vegetables, give us water, and we'll be fine. And God blessed them. You know, the, the Bible says that they were 10 times better than all the other counterparts who ate from the... The, you know, they ate from the king's um, table. And then you see the story continue, right? Where one day, this king, I don't know when you have too much power, sometimes it gets into your head. It's like, okay, what can I do today? Hmm. I want people to respect me more. What can I do? Okay, you guys go and build this statue. <laughs> so they build this statue, very big statue. And he says, okay, everyone, great and small, whatever you're, wherever you are in this city, I want you all to come. And at the sound of the Psalter and the harp and all the sounds, you're all going to bow to it, to worship this image. And he's like, which kind of demon entered this man? Because all of a sudden, everyone is supposed to do the one thing, the first commandment of the 10 commandments says, you shall have no other God before me. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, which is the summary, but no other God. Don't, don't take for yourself images to bow to. And so these people understood the law, right? They knew where they were coming from. They knew that God had said, here's how things should work. And so they refused to bow. Now, authority gave them an instruction, but there was a greater authority than that. So they had to bow the knee to that authority. And you see, sometimes you have to bypass the authority above you to honor, to truly honor. Let me go on a segue here and talk about spousal honor, right? So you're married and you have a husband or a wife. Now, the, the, the design in scripture is this. God wants every family where the husband and the wife submit to one another. Now, submission in that sense means different things. The Bible says submit to one another. What does that look like? The husband is supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That is submission. Do you realize that? That you're not going to love every other woman and treat them the same. No, you're going to love one woman 
so much the more that you are willing to die for her. That is his own way of honoring her. And then the woman, as the wife, is supposed to say, okay, symbolically, because you represent Christ in this union, I will honor and respect you. So whatever decisions you make will be final. Now, it does not diminish me in any way, but it's my way of saying I honor who? God, the institutionary or the, the one who set this concept of marriage in motion. And when you understand it that way, oh, it's so beautiful. Because now you're having two people submitting and honoring each other the way God has designed them to honor each other. But who are they truly honoring? When a man submits to the wife by loving her and willing to give his life for her, he's truly submitting to God. When the woman doesn't assert authority and she says, you know what? I wanted it to be this way. My husband says we should do it this way and I'm just going to accept it because he's the leader. Guess who, what she's doing? She's honoring God, the main authority. And, and that was what I was teaching last week if you were here. That when it comes to honor, your primary duty is to honor God and the institutions that he has put in place. So you don't have to honor people because they are good. You don't have to honor people because they are doing things right. You're honoring God because God says to honor. Praise God. So we looked at the fact that you may be in a particular situation in a country and the government you know, requires that you pay taxes. You pay your taxes because that is you honoring the authority that God has put in place. Now, if they are using taxes to squat, they are squandering the taxes, they are using it, putting in their pocket, like what happens every day in Nigeria, you know, politicians pocketing money, you know. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to say, ah, they're pocketing our money, so I'm not going to pay my, my taxes? Oh, no, because your original instruction is to honor all those who are in authority and the instructions that they put in place. So the Bible actually tells you in Romans, pay your taxes, don't owe any man anything. I know it was interesting. When Paul was writing this, the Roman government was in power. They were using Jews to take taxes from their own people. And Paul is saying, be a Christian. Do what God tells you to do regardless. Just forget how, how, how it wrestles in your heart that they are mis mishandling these things. Instead, pray for them, but honor those who are in authority. Not because they are the best leaders. Not because, you know, there will always be those debates about, oh, this person would have been better in power. But God knows. So how do you put yourself in the best position of honor? And to be honorable yourself, it's to trust God that the institution he has created is wise. It is full of wisdom. Let me show you that scripture again, because I really want you to, to, to keep this internal in your heart. It's um, Romans chapter 13. All right. I'm going to read it from the contemporary English version because it's very simple. Romans 13 from verse 1. If you have your Bibles, follow along, right? He says, obey the rulers who have authority over you. Only God can give authority to anyone. And he puts these rulers in their places of power. That's talking about the sovereignty of God. Yes, you guys did the elections. You guys counted the votes. But the fact that there is an authority over you, it's God that has ordained it. Did God pick that particular man? No, your election did, right? Your process did. But the fact that the person got there is not outside of the will of God. And that's something to understand that even in the sovereignty of God, there is the responsibility of man. Those don't clash. They don't fight each other. God is all powerful, all knowing. And so there's no conflict. Now you may not see the full picture, but he sees the full picture. And people who are very good at studying history, they start to see these things add up. Oh, this is why this person was in power at this time. Because this is what it's doing for the gospel. You know, and sometimes you see it if you study carefully. But, for example, who was in power at this time? It was, so you need to realize that the people that were in power here were against the, the Jews because the Jews believed in one God. The Romans didn't believe in one God. They had multiple gods. And so they were trying to enforce that on these people in different ways. 
to make it un unbearable. They are living the way they live their lives to make it just very, very hard and difficult, which is why they wanted a redeemer. They wanted a savior, a redeemer, someone who would come and fight for them, you know, overtake the Romans in the military rule. But Jesus came with a different mission. He wasn't trying to overthrow a government, uh, uh, a fiscal government. He was coming to overthrow the kingdom of darkness, uh, which is the more important, you know, kingdom to be to destroy. But anyway, I digress. Let's go on. It says only God can give authority to anyone. Verse two, people who oppose the authorities are opposing what God has done and they will be punished. So if you decide to be on that side and dishonor authorities, it says you'll be punished. Rulers are a threat to evil people, not to good people. There is no need to be afraid of the authorities. Just do what is right and they will praise you for it. Now, this is, it says, after, after all, they are God's servants and it's their duty to help you. If, so, if you do something wrong, you ought to be afraid because these rulers have the right to punish you. They are God's servants who punish criminals to show how angry God is. Is serious speech of Paul. He's saying God has designed the authority system to, to punish criminals and to reward those who do what is right. And for that reason and that reason alone, you must honor those in government and you must show in your life. So we looked at honoring your parents, even though they, they are not doing everything the way they should. We spent a long time talking about how parents are children that were thrown into this thing called parenting. And so they had to learn on the job. So you, many of them will not do, do it excellently, you know, but your responsibility as a child of God is to follow them and believe that God has an idea behind that rulership. Because guess what? You want your children to honor you, don't you? Like you definitely want, you don't want your children to, you know, look at you and, and give you an eye or pull up the middle finger, you know, but many of us don't feel like, many of us, when we are provoked, want to respond that way, you know, don't sow the wrong seeds, don't sow into the flesh, all right? Now, we talked about spiritual leaders as well, that last week we saw how much pain some, some, some of us have experienced just in a church setting, because as much as the church is God's powerful tool in, in transforming people's lives, the church is God's agency of, of giving the eternal life to people. It is God's agency for discipleship. God, the church, the ecclesia is God's idea. But guess what? It's, it consists of people who are sinners saved by grace. And what that means is that everyone is going to be at different levels of growth. So people are even going to be there that should not be there, right? They, they've rejected the gospel, but they just have an ulterior motive and they're in church. I've heard some stories of people that they were not in church or they were like, ah, okay, I want to marry. They know that I can find some good girls in church. So what do they do? They put on the mask and they act like Christians and they're in church. And so what tends to happen is someone encounters them. They're not discerning. They don't have the spirit of God. They cannot read between the lines. And they see this guy. Oh, he looks nice. He's handsome, tall, dark, and handsome. You know, he must know God. And you see him maybe he's flirting with the, you know, with the pastor. And you're like, I oh, must be very influential. And then he comes to you and he's giving you all these sweet words. And you're not discerning enough. Now, this person has no relationship with God, but he knows the talk. He knows Christianese. And he's like, ah, oh, we bless the Lord and all of that. And you know what happens? It becomes sexual. This person, you know, is like, oh, my God, what have I done? You know, this guy is a pretender. But at that point, it's too late. So what does the person start to say? The church is bad. Everyone in the church is bad. They are all pretenders. And so everyone gets to bear the brunt of that experience. And you see, that's not really the way we should see church. We should understand that on one hand, it is God's design that we belong to a local church. But on the other hand, realize that not everybody in church is in the church. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. J John, the apostle himself, this is not a new thing. To come to church and see pretenders is not a new thing at all. Look at First John real quick. First John, I've read this before, but I just want you to realize that 
they are they are they are lurking everywhere. You see them everywhere. So first John 2 and verse 18. I'm staying in the CEV, that's contemporary English version, because it's easy to understand. Verse 18, first John 2 18. Children, this is the last hour. You have heard the enemy of Christ, aka Antichrist, would appear at this time. And many of Christ's enemies have already appeared. So we know that the last hour is here. Now look at this. Verse 19. It says, these people came from our own group, yet they were not a part of us. They were in the group, but they were not a part of us. If they had been a part of us, they would have stayed with us. But they left, which proves that they did not belong to our group. And that's just a simple way of saying not everyone in church is a Christian. All right. I, someone used to say this thing. Um, uh, not every So two things. Not everywhere a car is parked is a garage. And he says not every garage is for, is for parking cars, something like that. And the point was it was making was, um, you know, be discerning. I said it at the very beginning when I was talking to, to um, Pearl about marks of a good church. You have to be able to find a good church, all right? And when you find a good church, stay there, but be discerning. Not everyone in the church is at the same level of spiritual growth, and there are all, also going to be foxes. There are going to be wolves, people who are not there for the same reason you are there. And so very, very quickly, you realize that the church is primarily, you know, going to be a hospital for a lot of people. And, you know, when you go to the hospital, you should, as a doctor or as another patient, be aware that there is there are risks, right? <laughs> Sorry. There are people who are responding to treatment, <laughs> right? There are people who are not responding to treatment and we're supposed to care for every one of them, right? As a medical practitioner, you've sworn an oath that you're not going to harm anyone, but you must realize that a lot of people are not responding to treatment. That's not the ideal situation, but it happens. And sometimes not only members, but sometimes even the leaders. They got there. Have you seen people that they gift they gift leadership positions in church? People, people where there are some things that happen in this world. Like you, you, you have money, you are one of the biggest givers. So they say you are a deacon. And they just give you and they ask them, quote one just one scripture that you know of by heart to show that at least you study the Bible. None. But they will give you leadership position in fact there was a, a church i visited i had not been there for more than two weeks and they were already saying they want to give me a position in the church i'm talking leadership position if, if i was if if i was the person that was testing for power and all of that they had a huge membership and they were like oh i want to put you in this position if i was not descending enough i would have been there you know just feeling myself oh see all these people i'm i'm leading and it, it could have ended up a disaster because I could see where that would have gone, honestly, because I can't even tell you some of the stories of things that happen in, in that, that community. But you see, if, if you have the right heart and you are thinking about people growing, people's faith being renewed and restored and strengthened, it, it holds you back in a way. Like it just, it, 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 it protects your heart. Protect your heart. A lot of people are in positions that they do not deserve. And that's why it's possible for you to be hurt in church. It's possible to have leaders and authority figures that maybe did not allow the word of God to actually transform them and, and, and you know, build them up. But the Bible is clear. We're supposed to honor the authority. Now, you may not honor them based on their character, but you must recognize that the church is still God's idea. Eldership in the church is still God's idea. I told you that according to terms and conditions, if you're in a church that is abusive and there is something going on that you cannot put a finger on, leave. Thank God there are many churches. You leave that church immediately. All right. Once you start seeing things that 
and not according to righteousness like so so many things are happening and you're like what's going on i mean you're in a church and every every member is just in about who who the choir who the choir master slept with last night and those are the conversations you are hearing and you are still there you will not know when you become the next person that is sleeping with that choir master you have to be very very discerning very very discerning that when it comes to this this whole topic of honor there are limits you're supposed to honor all men like i said and honor the authority system but there are times you just have to know where to pull the plug all right but with those key areas home which is your parents um governments or authorities and authorities in the church god says hey regardless of how they behave honor the system spiritual leadership is god's system governmental leadership is god's system parental leadership is god's system honor that system so you may not honor the person per se because or you, you may not respect them because they're not deserving of respect but the system the fact that god is the one that puts it there you honor god and a lot of things can change as a result of that. You know, when you try to fight back the system, the system has some punches to blow back at you. But if you honor God in serving in that system, uh, it, it brings a blessing to you. All right. Are we still here? Is it still making sense? Are, are we still together? Because I'm about to now establish yes. final points. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you for that one person that has been paying attention. I'm joking. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Good, good, good. So now, one last thought, and then we're going to pray, because I really want us to pray um, that God does something with the things we've been learning. You know, I gave an instruction earlier. I said, seek every single day to honor someone. And you know, there are different ways to express that honor, right? Sometimes it means giving. So if there's a, a leader, um, a pastor in your church that you've been listening or you've been eating the word for many years and that that pastor has not in any way you know contacted you know material blessing from you the bible is very clear that is not honor you honor people who labor in word and doctrine all right and um honor your parents if you've never given them anything no gift nothing i know maybe you're still under their roof but even if what's one thing you can do with your money that you know spend that money take care of their needs in, in the house show that you honor them because it's one way to honor right one of the best ways to honor is with your resources in fact almost every single time the bible says honor it has to do with resources that's that's mind-blowing don't even you think about it that honor is not just with your words in fact, Jesus would say they honor me. God, God said they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So, how is your heart far from God when all you have is lip service? Nothing, no substance. And that's why the Bible says, honor the Lord with what? Your substance, with the first fruits of your offspring. Or how does he say it? Proverbs 3. I've, I've forgotten how it was quoted, Sha. But honor the Lord with your substance. Meaning, the way to honor God is for something to leave you. And it's not always money. It could be a service. It could be a kind deed. But that's honor. Like, let it come from the wells of your heart to someone. Many times, it may not even be in the giving, which many times it is but it is in the recognition of God's authority. And God wants you to live as an honorable person. God wants you to live as an honorable person. God wants your life to be defined by honor. Like people see you and they know you, you honor God with your life. So you, you don't treat your body anyhow because the body of, your body is the temple of God. So you honor God with your body and instruction in the word of God as well. You honor the leaders by paying taxes, by not doing what is wrong in the society. You honor your parents by obeying them, by giving them gifts, by letting them know that you care and you, you, you are thankful for all their service in your life. And one of the things you can do is to recognize authority 
and that's how you become honorable. So if you're taking any notes, the, the summary of what I'm even about to talk about now is that the one of the best things you can do to be an honorable person is to train yourself in the recognition of authority. Train yourself in recognizing authority. Let me give you a biblical example. Remember, we started with all scripture is God inspired, right? It's for teaching, correcting, reproof, and training in righteousness. So let's look at First Samuel. There's a story that keeps blowing my mind. First Samuel. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Chapter 24. Now, if you don't know this story, go back, read it. It will bless you. But think about this. This is a story about David. And Saul, backstory, Saul does not like David. Who knows how he started? David was this nice guy who was, you know, like came for his for his uh, brothers. And when he came for the brothers, he heard this uncircumcised Philistine, Goliath, shouting, who is going to fight me? You know, bring your best man and everything. And David is provoked. He's like, who is defiling the, the Lord's army like this? What's going to be given to the person who defeats this Goliath? And the, the brothers are like, you, you're a small boy. Go back home, go and keep tending sheep. And David is angry. And he says, I'm going to fight. I'm going to deal with this guy who is abusing God. And so he comes to Saul. And Saul is like, uh, why should I give you the stage? What have you done? What's your resume? And then David's like, I fought the bear. I fought the lion. Who is this one that of circumcised Philistine that I cannot destroy? And so Saul is like, okay. Well, it is what I'm, what I'm going to do to impress who defeats Goliath. I'm mixing up the story just because I want to get to the point. Um, well, I'll give you my, my daughter, you know, my daughter's hand in marriage. Well, David is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And so he goes, and we know the story, right? David kills Goliath. Every Sunday school participant knows that story. So Goliath dies, and then everyone is, like, celebrating. And so what happens? You know, he... Saul keeps his promise. Saul loves David at this point. Like, there's no evidence in scripture that Saul is angry with David. You know, like, wow, for somebody has finally taken over and defeated this enemy. But here's what happens. They start chanting on the road. Saul has killed his thousands. David, his ten thousands. How many times has David fought any battle? <laughs> but you know how people can just provoke jealousy. And so Saul started hearing it. Saul has fought people, but David, he has killed 10,000. And so jealousy started to grow in his heart. And so Saul found many opportunities to kill David. In fact, there was a particular time that David was there. He called David to, to, to play the harp for him. And the king was so angry. The Bible says the, an evil spirit came upon him and he took a javelin. And tried to kill David right there as he was singing and playing the, the, the stringed instru instrument. And he, he, he evaded that. That was one way that he knew that, okay, <laughs> this king wants me dead. And so the story goes on. David goes for, you know, in hiding. Jonathan comes on the scene. There's a lot of this story. I, I, can, I don't have the time to tell. But in, in Psalm, 1 Samuel 24, let's follow the story. All right. So this is where the scriptures are supposed to instruct us, right? So make sure you read it with that um, idea in your mind that there's something God wants to say here to us. So let's look at it. I'm reading from the simple translation again. First Samuel 24, from verse 1. When Saul got back from fighting of the Philistines, he heard that David was in the desert around En Gedi. So David is running for his life. Saul gets word that David is hiding. Saul led 3,000 of Israel's best soldiers out to look for David and his men near wild goat rocks at En Gedi. There were some sheep pens along the side of the road, and one of them was built around the entrance to a cave. Saul went into the cave, and what did he go to do? He went to use the bathroom, basically, in the cave. So Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. But guess what? As that, you know, that Telemundo, which which um, movie that you, what, what shows do you normally watch? You know how the story twists. The person you want to attack now is found in that place where you want to kill them. And you are not the one at their mercy. That's exactly what happens here. So 
David and his men were hiding in that cave that Saul went to relieve himself. And so what did they tell him? They whispered to David, the Lord told you he was going to let you defeat your enemies and you must do whatever you want with them. This must be the day the Lord was talking about. So they were inspiring David like, you see, the moment, the hour of destiny has arrived. God said that you're going to defeat all your enemies. Saul is your enemy. So this is your opportunity to kill him. And so David sneaked over. I feel like he was believing the words of these, his, um, you know, of his men. And David went, sneaked over and cut off a small piece of Saul's robe. But Saul didn't notice a thing. Look at verse 5. This is the heart of a man that honors God. Man, may God give us this kind of heart. May God just humble us in such a way that we were able to see people beyond who they are and how they present to be. That we'll see them as God has ordained them to be. Paul said, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. We don't treat people based on sight alone. We are spiritual people. We see beyond. Hallelujah. Verse 5, David was sorry that he had even done that. So the fact that he, did, he didn't kill Saul, but he cut the rope. He was still pissed at himself. And he told his men, stop talking foolishly. We are not going to attack Saul. He is my king. And I pray that the Lord will keep me from doing anything to harm his words. His chosen king. So David is able to recognize the authority that God placed on this man. Saul had gone out of the good graces of, of, of God at this point. I hope you realize that. Like, this was not God's idea. First of all, that Saul would be king. It was the will of the people. And Saul had already started going to the way of the, of, of you know, the, um, what they call those people. People that, you know, bring people back from the dead. He was already going to, like, sorcery. And even though he had turned his back from the Lord and God had said, I'm changing my kingdom, David is the one appointed. David was still able to recognize that even though the spirit of God has departed from Saul, he's still the one in authority. So that's the instruction for us that we look beyond what people are doing, even when they are our enemies, even when they want the worst for us. So if you are in your workplace, which is another realm of governmental authority, and your boss hates your gods, and they're angry with you, guess what? Deliver on the job. Honor them. When is their birthday? Give, get them a gift. Don't speak evil of them. Don't talk to your colleagues and say, ah, that boss, that my boss. No, don't speak against the Lord's chosen. In that situation, they are the Lord's chosen. They are at a time in your life to be the authority figure over you. So honor them, respect them, deliver on the job, be faithful. Look at this. Verse Verse 6, he's my king. I pray that the Lord will keep me from doing anything to harm his chosen king. Saul left the cave and started down the road. I love this story. So watch this. Um, soon David got up and left the cave. So this is after Saul had gone a distance. He came out and shouted, your majesty. So David is still calling him by his title. Oh, man, there's a lot to learn here. And then he says, Saul, okay, Saul turned around to look and David bowed down very low. Not only did he call him by the name, he bowed. And he said, your majesty, why do you listen to people who say that I am trying to harm you? You can see for yourself that the Lord gave me the chance to catch you in the cave today. Some of my men wanted to kill you but I wouldn't let them do it. I told them I must not harm the Lord's chosen king. Your majesty, look at what I'm holding. You can see that is a piece of your robe. If I cut off a piece of your robe, oh, I'm, I bet you I could have killed you, but I let you live. And this should prove that I'm not trying to harm you or to rebel. I haven't done anything to you, yet you keep trying to ambush me and kill me. Now, here's the key thing, because someone might be here and you may be like, Okay, I get you. You're saying I should live at peace with all men. I should honor people that God has placed over me. But I don't know how to do this thing. 
because I'm hurt and I just know that justice is a real thing. They must pay, you know, they've treated me wrongly, they've done all these things. But you see, when it comes to the subject of honor, God doesn't just tell us to honor people as a blanket statement. He tells us because he is in charge. He just doesn't want us to put the responsibility of judgment and justice on our shoulders. So what does David say in verse 12? He says, I, let, I will let the Lord decide which one of us has done right. I pray that the Lord will punish you for what you're doing to me, but I will not do anything to you. And he quotes an old proverb. He says, only evil people do evil things, so I will not harm you. And I like, I, I like to play this, you know, I would love to play this movie in my head and see what it looks like. David is far off. Saul is far away. This person he wanted to kill just had the opportunity to kill him, but didn't. And now he's like, why do you want to kill me? I had an opportunity to mess you up. I had an opportunity to, to end your career because you have been a bad boss. I saw what you did. You know, this, this, this. But instead of disregarding you and putting you in that situation, I did it. So I leave it to God. Like, whatever your situation looks like, this is the mindset to have. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. That's what God says. So become an honorable person. Decide from today that you will be an honorable person. You, you will be someone who will honor God regardless of the situation. That you will have a heart, a humble heart that says it's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to or soft authority. I'm not going to do anything that God has not told me to do, except to honor. I will honor all men. I will not treat them with disregard. And because of my doing so, the name of Jesus will be glorified. Praise the name of Jesus. I want us to turn those words right now to prayer, to a heartfelt prayer. You know where it is right now in your heart where you're not honoring people. Maybe you've spoken nasty words about a pastor over you. Maybe you've, you've said some words, irrevocable words against your parents. Maybe it's a heart of rebellion against the government and the figures that God has placed over you. But God is instructing you today. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up in due time. He will lift you up. When you honor God, he will honor you. And, and how else would you love to be honored except by God? It's, it's not the same as man's honor, trust me. So can we begin to pray right now? Just say, Lord, I humble my heart before you today. I humble my heart before you. I am honorable. I live an honorable life. Just like David, who had the opportunity to exact revenge. I will not revenge. I will not fight back. I will let it Stay in your hands, the hands of vengeance, the hands of justice in the name of Jesus. Please, I want you to pray. And if, if, you, if you want to unmute yourself, just to let people also feel that sense of prayer in this community, feel free to do that. But just pray and say, Lord, give me a heart. Give me a heart that is humble, a heart that honors you, that honors your will, honors your word. And, and just give me a heart, a contrite heart. In the name of Jesus, begin to pray that right now. Pray that right now. Pray that right now. Let the Lord, by his spirit, mold your heart, conform it to his will. And you are conformed to the will of God. That you are conformed to the will of God. There is humility in my heart. I will not fight against authority. I will be an honorable person. And Lord, help me to recognize authority when I see you. Help me to recognize grace when I see you. Help me to recognize the power that you have put upon a person due to their position. Help me to recognize it. Help me to recognize it. Help me to recognize it. I recognize walk as an honorable man that honors you in all things. Yes, I honor you. 
honor the authority you have placed. I honor the people that you put over me. I respond with honor. My substance knows it. My heart knows it. My body knows it. I honor you, God. Thank you, Father. I walk in honor. Jesus, mighty name, we pray. Amen. Ah, you know, and this is this is very specific for someone. You this is this is near and dear to your heart because yeah, the teaching has been very instructive, but right now you're in, in that situation where you are struggling. You are struggling because you 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 have that you know God's word is clear on all men, on all people, but there is just a a a rebellion in your heart. I want to I want to, to instruct you by the authority of the word of God. Allow him to change your heart. Allow him to remold your heart. Allow him to remold your heart. Stop resisting. Stop, stop allowing your flesh to gain dominance. Let the spirit guide you. Let the spirit lead you. Let the spirit humble your heart. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless you because we are blessed in Christ. We worship you. We thank you for the privilege of living as sons and daughters to a mighty God, a God who is authority over all authorities. And, Lord, we are aware not only are we aware, we thank you for the structure you have put in our lives, of putting leaders, authority figures. We thank you for your wisdom in doing that because it's it's in putting these authorities in government that we're able to have live peaceably, where corruption is dealt with, where criminals are dealt with, and where good things done are recognized. It's your system. Lord, you put spiritual authority so that we may grow and be instructed in your word. You put parental authority so that we may have, if possible, a template for how to honor you and to be led and directed by them, to be guided and protected till the time when you will take that full ownership of us. Thank you for giving us biological parents. Thank you for giving us spiritual parents. Thank you for giving us governmental authorities. So, Lord, we ask together as a family that you help us honor them. Help us live honorably in a way that pleases you every day of our lives. And for anyone who is struggling sincerely to honor someone because they have just not lived a life worthy of honor, Lord, help us to see that the honor is your instruction. It's not, it's not dependent on their um, worth or their worthiness or their deserving of respect. It is on you. It is on you. It is given. And so, Lord, help our hearts. Help our hearts. Even as we are conformed into the image of Christ every day of our lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray for that incessant headache, that headache that has been consistently there right now. I pray that it is gone right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Healing for you. Permanent healing right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Who is that person? Who who who's that person that had um uh, that's had a severe headache? Very I said in on behalf of my sister. Okay, is she listening in? No, she's not. I'm person not at here. home. The person is here. Okay. Is um, it's me. Who's that? Okay, Judith. Yeah. All right. Has it gone? Yeah, I feel better now. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Lord. And it's not coming back in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. I have good news. Um, as we wrap this up. Um, hmm, can I share this with you? Yes. So 
Um, we're having a training very soon, and I'm just making it public now, but there's a whole process to it. But I really want to um, extend an invitation to anyone who wants to be able to um, teach and communicate God's word effectively. And you feel like it's something God yeah. is calling you to do, and you you need an opportunity. You want to have an opportunity to learn um, and take some of the nuggets that I have learned myself. Um, I'm inviting you for a training. It's called Apt to Teach. And the information is going to be on the group very soon. It's not open to everyone. It's open to those who really want this. So make sure you look out for the announcement. And whatever they ask you to do, do it so that you can be a part of that training. All right. So please, this is something you want. Don't miss it for anything. It will bless you. I think God wants to do a lot of things with us. A lot of people who have been through Bible Marathon and have somehow maybe gone to do other things. It's just, it's just the inspiration of seeing what they could do for God. And I'm so thankful for that, that I'm seeing people, you know, growing in the things of God on their own. Like, you know, they come here, they learn stuff. They're like, I can do this. And they go and do things. That's success for us in Bible Marathon because we're running the race. And I want everyone to be able to have their own personal ministry where they are blessing people, training people, seeing people saved. All right. So uh, if this is something you want to be a part of, look out for the announcement on the on the group chat very soon all right any comments questions thoughts as we wrap up now feedback okay so i think we're good i love you guys so much if you have any questions please reach out on friday uh oh i'm not going to be around this friday okay so up yeah so instead of bible um Instead of word dinner happening on Friday, because I don't want people to have to have two meetings, people who will be in, in the training, um, there, there will not be, let me hold that back. Maybe I'll do a recording. Maybe I'll do a recording, but I, I like to do it with people. So let's see. It's very possible that word dinner doesn't hold um, this, this Friday, just so we can have that training. All right. So yeah, that's, that's it from me. Thank you guys for showing up. Judith, nice to see you. Hope to see you more and you know, even get to know you better. Um, and uh, Nicholas, and, oh, this is Bar, uh, praises. Yeah, okay. Nice, nice to have you around today. All right, everyone, have a beautiful rest of your day. If I, I'm in DC, if you want to see me, come and say hi. Yo. All right. Um, I love you guys so much. Bye.